Welcome to IBA 306 Business Ethics and Corporate Governance. We're moving quite into those final parts of the unit and into some of the final topics. So this is chapter 10 and it is topic 11. And in this topic, we're looking at civil society and business ethics. So um, you're probably quite um, used to me saying how interesting this topic is, but the civil society uh, aspect really brings in another context and also some of the, it highlights some of the complexities as well. So let's start having a look at this and how civil society and business ethics plays into um, this topic and business. To do this, we're going to be covering how civil society organisations, CSOs, and sometimes they're called um, civil society organisations, and it depends on the different government, but you also have NGOs and social enterprises that come into this category as well. So how they, they, get, they are actually key stakeholders. Um, they, if we go back to um, Mitchell, Agel and Woods, issue of stakeholders in terms of power, legitimacy and urgency, um, CSOs can quite often come into play in all three of those categories. So they are key stakeholders. So we're going to examine some of the tactics these groups might use um, and you can hopefully all stimulate some really interesting thoughts. And we'll discuss the impacts of globalisation in terms of civil society organisations and how that impacts on organisations. We'll also look at the relationships between business and civil society organisations and we'll be then finalising with assessing some of civil society in terms of corporate sustainability. So let's get started. So in this first part, we're going to be look at civil society in a very general term. Um, I'd like to also highlight that what we cover in these lectures and these topics and also in the textbook is we're just we're really looking at um, introducing the ideas. So going deeper into them, some of these aspects are huge topics within themselves. So just be aware of that. So this civil society is also known as a third sector. So in some of the academic literature, you'll be seeing that, that reference to the third sector. So it includes pressure groups, non-government organisations, so NGOs, charities, religious groups. Um, essentially the definition we have here is that they're neither business nor government organisations but those that are involved in the promotion of certain interests, causes and or goals. So that alone in itself is quite complex in terms of um, civil society organisations and what their interests are. So each one will be quite different in their interests. For example, you've got Greenpeace, Oxfam, things like that. So civil society is the third sector and this shows you in the Venn diagram how civil society is down the bottom um, and then you've got the market sector which is your businesses and then you've got the state sector where the government. So they all come into play and intermingle and impact each other and influence each other. So this is what we're going to, to touch on during this topic and it's, yeah, it's quite an intriguing topic actually. So when we start to look at civil society organisations, we there, there's different um, scopes in terms of how these um, characteristics of civil society organisations look. Uh, no, no one size fits all. Um, some of the categories that this literature goes into is looking at the scope of that civil society organisation, so what they actually cover, the activities, you know, what do they actually do and the focus, so sometimes it might be environmental, it might be social, and it might even be into um, a more specific thing. Uh, in terms of your case analysis, when you're looking at Outland Denim, um, they started out as a social enterprise, which is also comes into the category of civil society organisations. So their focus was actually on human trafficking. The structure of that organisation, and sometimes those structures change as well, but how they're actually structured. Do they go across borders? Are they global? Are they national? Are they local? Things like that. And also the types of organisations. So it could be a community group, um, you know, like land care. They could actually be almost considered a civil society organisation. Um, and land care is more a, a community group. 
um, maybe even Neighbourhood Watch would come into something like this. So it's some of these civil society organisations. They're very nebulous in what they look like. So as a stakeholder, I touched on this and how salient and also legitimate they can be. Um, and again, that's on a continuum. But there's a very significant growth in the number, the power and the influence of these civil society organisations. And as time goes by, they're actually becoming more and more important in social development and how we actually approach and some of the pressure on business and government. Um, if you think about some of the issues that are happening today, um, we've just ex been experiencing some of the um, school children, okay, where they've actually been walking out of school to um, voice their concerns over climate. So that can actually be some of that, that growth in that, that social action of communities coming together. So it's civil, civil society. So the stakes that are held by civil society organisations is largely one of firstly representing the interests of individual stakeholders, like I just mentioned with individual school children, and that's just an example of how that could actually escalate into being a civil society organisation. Um, potentially some of those kids would be you know, candidates for running a civil society organisation or being part of one because they've got that, that spirit in them that they have to they want to contribute to society and they need to actually voice their concerns and do something about it. So they also represent the interests of non-human stakeholders, which we're going to be going into, particularly in our discussion point today. So the social license to operate. So it's the, the approval and acceptance of a company's activities by society, especially among local communities and civil society. Now all along, it, this, it, this is this balance of business and society and how much influence business has on society, society on business. So it's quite an interesting how that balance um, plays out and also how it changes all the time. You know, it, particularly depending on the politics that is happening, that balance of, of how they interact and who's more influential or is perceived to be more influential than the other. So. These organisations, the civil society organisations, they shape the extent to which a firm is to seen as having the ongoing approval and broad acceptance of society to conduct its activities. Now when you think about some of the large organisations and some of the, the civil society um, um, development, um, I'm thinking of McDonald's for example. Now it's not an actual civil society, but you ended up, we ended up with this whole movement going against the, the poor nutrition of McDonald's. And that, was be, that created a huge groundswell and it actually impacted the business where they started to look at having more nutritional value and healthier choices. So this gives you an idea of some of the different types of civil society organisations. You've got sectional groups and promotional groups. Um, some of the aspects that come into the, the types of civil society organisations, you've got membership where it could be open to everybody joining or it could be a closed membership. Um, the representation, it could be of a specific community or society or it could be actually based more on issues or causes. Quite often their aims um, with the sectional groups are self-interest and where the promotional groups would be more social goals. And then traditional, um, you've got more an insider group and you might be thinking, I mean, I'm thinking of sort of maybe more sectional um, where you actually have uh, groups coming together with a cause or sometimes based on a, a fundamental belief. And where the promotional groups, it's more everybody can join in as long as they've got the same social belief. So their approaches are quite different and also the, the extent of their actual pressure. Um, you know, sometimes with the sectional groups, we're saying that they actually threat their with withdrawal of their support. And then the promotional groups go for more mass media. And these days, particularly social media, which is amazing how things get out and travel around the globe. 
So this is, um, I'll be referring to this a little bit um, as we go through, but this is a, a graph of trust in, in non-government organisations. Now this comes from Edelman, I've given you the, the link there, and it's quite significant in terms of trust, distrust, and how we're actually situated. So you'll, you'll see down there um, some of the distrust in six markets, which is really interesting in itself because that's distrust of the people in NGOs in those particular markets. So we've got UK there, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, countries like that, that you think of trust being quite high, but it's quite interesting, like the Netherlands, that's where Greenpeace has been based for many, many years. Um, they had impacts um, happening there. So possibly, you know, you've got to question sort of why these, what, what this trust factor actually means. But some really interesting data in terms of um, encouraging you to have a look. And of course, have your critical lens on it. You know, think about what's happened in those countries for that distrust in NGOs. Now, the discussion point we're going to go to today, um, I think it's, we talked about stakeholders and we talked about non-human stakeholders. So in recent times, the last couple of years, um, we've gained three notable new legal persons. They're three rivers, two in India and one in New Zealand. Now this means that these rivers actually have a legal status, okay? And they're non-human stakeholders, but they have a legal status. So if, do if adopting a utilitarianism view versus a normal, um, sorry, versus a moral rights view, what would be the ability of a river to be legally represented? Um, what would be some of the issues that come up with that? So think about that in terms of, you know, I've put some examples here, access to water, dumping into the river. What are the consequences, particularly from a cost-benefit analysis view, um, would be some of those issues? Maybe you want to consider some of the long-term issues versus short-term, the pros, the cons. Um, if you'd like more on this, I've put a link here to the conversation and it gives you more on this actual um, topic of non-human stakeholders, particularly with these rivers and um, their rights. So, very interesting point and I'd love to um, see what you guys actually come up with and um, I suggest that you start thinking about this and take some notes on it before we move on to part two. See you in a few minutes.